Well, um, thank you for, for having me here. Um, I hate that bio. I'm a pharmacist who became a pharmacist when my mom got sick. I wanted to be a sports broadcaster when I grew up. I'm supposed to be at spring training right now in a pair of shorts, writing about the cheating Houston Astros. <laughs> But I became fascinated about how, like, this molecule on this nucleus could actually, like, help mom be mom, and this molecule on that same nucleus would cause her to not be. And it was impossible to do that and be both a pharmacy student and a caregiver and not appreciate the fact that based on the coverage that she had at the time as a dual, hard to believe that I was in school when Medicare didn't cover prescription drugs in the outpatient setting, I know, but um, it's true. And I learned a lot about this stuff on the ground, helping um, my, my mom actually access the, the healthcare system. I got lucky and went to Washington for a summer internship, caught Potomac fever. And before I knew it, I was going back every summer and um, got deeper and deeper and deeper into this stuff. But at the end of the day, everything that I think about the system that Sarah did a great job describing um, has her and patients like her in the center. Um, you, you know from the internet that in May of 2018, President Trump announced the blueprint to lower prescription drug prices, and there were, there were four buckets in there. The, the, the blueprint began with a what's the problem section, and I really appreciate that Sarah began that way because it's not just the prices, it's the black box um, that, that Murray described in, in his introduction. And that's why we chose to focus on four areas. Now, prior to Secretary Azar coming on board, the White House did have work groups on drug pricing, and it was by and large a rehash of all the Republican <laughs> ideological ideas, like let's just increase competition, um, and more drugs competing with each other will lead to lower costs, and anytime someone brought up anything avant-garde, it was like, no, we, we can't do that because it's never been done before. And the secretary came in, and before you know it, we have a blueprint and a rose garden ceremony talking about the importance of increasing competition, but also improving negotiation. Now, negotiation in this instance, and we'll talk about in a second, means improving the competition that exists among Part D plans, but has gotten pretty stale since 2006 and also creating a new form of competition in Medicare Part B where we don't have private plans uh, in Medicare fee-for-service negotiating lower drug prices on our behalf. We're a big dumb payer. We get a, an invoice from a doctor that says this is the average sales price of the drug plus 6%, never mind how much I may have paid for it through the GPO that my large practice purchases from. Um, pay me the ASP plus six. And that might create a perverse incentive where anytime you're paying a physician a higher amount based on the percentage of the price of the drug and the drug price going down causes that physician to go underwater, though every physician I've spoken to says, I did not go to medical school to run a pharmacy and prescription drugs are not a profit center of my practice. We also wanted to create incentives to lower list price. And I'm gonna speak quite a bit about the importance of, of list price because the challenge behind the prices that ICER is looking at and that many people are talking about is not the price that the insurance company is actually paying for the drug. And there has been a growing difference between the list price of the drug and the net price of the drug, such that PBMs and payers have actually done a really good job of starting to control drug trend, but you wouldn't see it at the pharmacy counter for a number of reasons. And all of those three buckets were intended to float together so that we could actually reduce patient out-of-pocket costs, because that's what we think is the problem, uh, or they think is the problem. It's a hard habit to break. Um, <laughs> The reason the blueprint came together this way is because of this guy, my friend Dan Best, who unfortunately is no longer with us. Um, Dan was a Pfizer exec before he became a CVS exec. So this is literally the guy that negotiated both sides of the same conversation. And the guy who, when, say, a former Eli Lilly employee who now has a position in the federal government said no, I'm not going to give you a 6% discount on Humalog. Good luck selling health insurance without having Lily's insulin on board. Said, okay, I'll give it a whirl. 
there's two other products and came back the next year and asked for twice as much as a discount. A discount that today is now upwards of 50%. 15 minutes after this picture was taken, Dan sat down for his one-on-one -on -one with the secretary. It was supposed to be a 15 minute, welcome aboard, here's your PIV card, the bathroom is down the hallway on your left. It turned into a three hour masterclass on everything that goes on inside the drug negotiating, purchasing, and dispensing process. Everything from drug rebates all the way down to DIR and dispensing fees. And I sat there, having been someone that worked at a drug company and a health plan in a few different places, just taking notes and asking clarifying questions, and that conversation became the blueprint. We could have used the alternate title, here's the policy proposals we've put together because we know where all the bodies are buried. <laughs> As a refresher, drug companies make drugs, sell them to pharmacies, consumers pay insurers for insurance, insurers pay pharmacies for the drugs that their consumers use, and consumers pay a copayment and leave with the drugs. Are there any questions about the US pharmaceutical supply chain? <laughs> yeah, hold your camera, because that's not at all what this looks like. This, this is what it looks like. A drug company makes a drug, sells it at a discount to a wholesaler who probably marks it up when they sell it to a pharmacy. The pharmacy then marks it up and dispenses it to the consumer. The price the consumer pays is the price that was established by the formulary and benefits agreement that the pharmacy benefit manager negotiated on behalf of the payer. The drug company gives a rebate based on volume or competition or any number of factors that never really flows back to the patient. And the payer doesn't even know what the discount they're getting on each drug is. If an executive of the PBM industry was at this podium, they would say, we disclose all of our rebates to our payers. And in many instances, we pass them through. That is true at the aggregate level. And I know that I worked for a health plan that by switching from Argus to CVS was able to get an additional $125 million in rebates, which was a good thing because we used those dollars to pay for the system's implementation costs of the Affordable Care Act. Now, some would think that every one of those dollars flows directly to premium or patient cost sharing. It does not. If I want to know what am I paying on net, for each of these NDCs. In most instances, I cannot get that information from my pharmacy benefits manager. If the CEO of a large business in my health plan service area calls me and says, you don't cover my wife's migraine drug anymore, and I call the head of pharmacy and say, can we add this drug back to the formulary? They say, sure, let me call the PBM. And the PBM says, Happy to add it, I'll update the system tonight. Oh, by the way, you're going to lose $50 million in rebates because you're now going off template. And the question is, well, wait a minute, like how does my deciding to cover this drug for the 3.5 million people in my area cause me to lose $50 million in rebate? And it's like, well, because you're going off of the national template. Well, how much is my portion of that? You're going off the national template. So this, in many instances, is the problem that we tried to address when we put together a comprehensive approach to increase competition, not just more new brands, more juice generics, more new biosimilars, but to stop the regulatory shenanigans. Drug companies say, that's a Scott Gottlieb term, not mine, um, but regulatory shenanigans whereby you say, well, I get that you're allowed to make a generic copy of my drug, but I'm gonna hide behind the FDA safety rules to not give you enough of that product in samples so that you can make enough to test it and actually bring a generic to market. Regulatory shenanigans are when your patent starts to expire and someone is ready to go with a competitive product and you pay them not to compete with you. Those are legal, but it's why we can't have nice things. And that's why we called them shenanigans. 
We also wanted to improve negotiation. Now, I could spend all day on all the little ins and outs on, on, on Part D, just the way the benefit is designed, right? There's one particular thing called um, any medically acceptable indication. If I decide that I'm going to cover one of the drugs that Sarah showed for rheumatoid arthritis, for example, or it's a great drug, I can't say, I'm not so sure you're as good of a drug in psoriasis, so I'm going to pay you a different amount. Many drugs have many different indications, and once they get on the formulary, it is really hard to stop them from being used. And if you try as a plan, to do good prior authorization, PA to label, make sure the patient's actually supposed to be using the drug, and the patient complains and takes it all the way up through the appeals process, every time the patient appeals and you lose, it counts against your plan's quality rating. And that's what Dan used to call the screen door in the submarine. It's like, yeah, it works, but it doesn't work. It's there, it's a door, but it really doesn't keep water out. If a plan knows that I'm going to get hurt by saying no to a drug that somebody shouldn't have, they're going to give it to them. We also, as I mentioned, wanted to create new forms of competition in Part B where, where it doesn't exist today. But much of the focus that got a lot of the attention was on our focus on list price. List price matters. High gross to nets hurt patients. I get angry, shakingly angry, every time I hear someone talk about insulin, because the list price of that drug of $540 is not what the drug company is selling it to the insurer for. After rebates and discounts, that class is probably $140. Hepatitis C, bargain at $84,000. Guess what? Most states are paying 11. Most private commercial insurers are probably paying 22. And you saw a 40% discount the second that a brand competitor was introduced to that drug. But when the patient goes to a pharmacy and they have a high deductible health plan or they pay a specialty coinsurance that's a percentage, that percentage is calculated on the list price of the drug. And that's a problem. So we wanted to compress list price in a number of ways. One was by addressing the role of rebates and basically saying, hey, PBM and health plan, you can no longer extract these rebates and hold on to them. If you get that discount, you got to give it to the patient. Patient comes in to pay for their insulin, it should be $140. If they pay a 20% coinsurance, it should be $28. It should not be the list price of the drug. And we also wanted to create a counterweight to that by requiring drug companies to post the actual list price of the drug in their direct-to-consumer advertisements as sort of an added incentive to bring the list price down. This is your list price. And I thought J&J &J did a great job of actually complying with that by saying, here's the list price of our drug. Most of you will pay this instead, $47. Ask your pharmacist or insurer if you're not paying $47 and instead paying something greater than that. But this was intended to change the way the whole system worked together. One of the problems with this system is that everybody but the patient benefits when the list price of the drug goes up. A wholesaler who's currently making 2% on a $400 billion market today, if that market was cut in half, would think, well, I need 4% now because they want to stay revenue neutral. So when everybody benefits by the list price of a drug going up, why do we think the list price is going to go down? And that's what happens. When I launch a new drug today, I am going to price it higher than my competitor because then I can give a larger rebate to the payer. I am buying my way onto the formulary and saying, here is a larger difference between gross and net. Use it however you see fit. Now, those rebates are important in paying for drugs that don't have any competition. I'm looking at you, Revlimid. And absent those discounts and the money that, that come in the form of rebates, 
payers will say, well, our costs are going to go up. What are we supposed to do? And that is a valid question, but I really wish the focus was on the drugs that aren't giving a discount to the payer, as opposed to the very political expedient conversation of let's talk about drugs that are in highly competitive classes and have been around for a long time and are giving large rebates. We also wanted to do some things to make it easier for consumers to understand when lower cost drugs were available, et cetera. So what happened? Well, instead of everybody saying, hey, this is great, you want to do a comprehensive approach to fix a private market problem, let's all work together and solve it, they took out $10 million of ads praising what they liked and $10 million of ads criticizing us, calling us socialists for the things that they didn't like. And as a result, many good ideas didn't happen. And if that good idea doesn't happen, but this good idea doesn't happen, then you get accused of favoring this stakeholder and not that stakeholder. And then suddenly the focus is, is on increasing transparency and ending foreign free riding. Because it's pretty clear to the president that we pay far more than other countries, and he doesn't like that. So the top three questions I've got since I left are, when is the international price index coming out? Um, I don't know. And, and the reason I don't know is because some believe we wanted to give Congress time to act. Here's this crazy socialist proposal that says we're going to pay no more in Medicare than the average of what other wealthy countries pay. Some believe the reason you haven't seen it yet is because if we released that rule, it would cause the baseline that the Congressional Budget Office uses to calculate the savings of Wendell's bill to change. And that would take like eight weeks for staff to write a new thing. But more importantly, the things that Wendell's going to pay for with that money might not be able to be paid for because some of that money went away. Some people believe you haven't seen the International Price Index yet because on July 5th, when I was on my way to the golf course, the president was getting on a helicopter and said, when I get back, I'm going to introduce an executive order and we're going to get favored nation pricing. We're going to get the best price of any country or company. Well, that's very different than an international average. So some are wondering, is this going to be an international average or is this going to be the best price of any country or company? Some people believe it's because the president wants to include not just Medicare Part B, which was originally intended, but Medicare Part B and Part D as well. So it remains to be seen when that'll come out. Hopefully a question on importation will, will, will come up because um, I don't have time, according to Murray, to, to, to talk about that right now. <laughs> um, but we talked about how this list price phenomenon matters. And we've talked about how more patients have drug deductibles than ever before. More plans are using four or five tiers, and those higher tiers require you to pay a percentage of the list price of the drug. <laughs> that, to me, is the problem. Now, many people ask during the rebate rule, what do you got against PBMs? I don't have anything against PBMs. To quote Jack Nicholson in, in A Few Good Men, I want them on that wall. I need them on that wall. Absent somebody negotiating drug prices against the pharmaceutical industry, who knows what prices we'd pay? And PBMs are doing a very good job of controlling trend. Read their reports every year. Express Scripts is claiming 0.4% increase in drug tent. CVS Health is calling it 3.3. I, th uh, I think others at JP Morgan last month were talking about negative trend. They're doing a good job, but where that money goes is the real question. As the spread between list and net continues to exist, how are patients benefiting from the fact that brand name drugs on net went up 0.3% in 2018? Yeah, they took 5.5% list price increases, some of them three, some of them are higher. The president tweeted at them, said they were bad. We publicly shamed them. And at the end of the day, we know that the real net price of the drug only went up 0.3%. But patients don't feel that at the pharmacy counter because Part D plans are actually bearing less risk for Part D benefits. I like many things in the congressional proposals. Um, the changing of the benefit to require plans to be more on the hook 
I think is an important part of that because right now plans have gone from being accountable for 75% of the benefit to being accountable for less than half. And taxpayers are now on the hook through Medicare's reinsurance program to pick up over half of Part D's costs. And that's why when the actuary at CMS said this rebate rule is going to cost the federal government $196 billion. People said, well, wait a minute. Do we really want to do a rule that's going to cost $200 billion over 10? But I looked at their assumptions, and they assumed that all drug companies immediately took 25% of the rebate and put it straight in their pocket because they lost in the budget deal. And then they said, well, and, and some of them are probably going to actually increase their list price. It was in incredibly, I'll say interesting instead of arrogant, for the CMS actuary to come out with a single point estimate describing both the behavior of the managed care industry and the effect on future drug price increases and saying this we're sure is going to happen. Now Milliman looked at it a number of different ways, six to be exact. In their scenario one they said let's just take all the money from rebates and apply it to premiums. What happens? Premium go up. We think it's going to go up $35 billion, though, not $196 billion. Why? Because they actually looked at trend in brand, specialty, and generic, not just using CMS's national health expenditures number. And then they said, but what we think is going to happen is PBMs aren't going to take that lying down. So they're going to start designing formularies that favor low net cost drugs as opposed to high cost, high rebate drugs. And if they do that, it actually has the potential to save $80 billion. And we think drug companies, not wanting to go off the formulary, are going to say, oh, you're going to force us to compete on a lower price? How about we actually start responding by lowering our list price instead of raising our, net, our list price just to give you a lower net? And if that actually happened, the federal government would have saved $100 billion. Now, I have some issues with the fact that the CMS actuary, even two years out, is typically 23% wrong and always high when they predict their premiums. And that trend gets worse the farther out they go. So when the Congressional Budget Office or the CMS actuary scores a bill, and I have to defer to them, it is the official score of a policy, I do want to have conversations about what numbers are you actually using to calculate the growth. And what business behavior are you actually trying to predict? So I'll, I'll stop there because Murray's waving at me. Um, I, I, I do hope that we get to um, some important conversations about what's next in terms of what's going on in the House and the Senate and, and some of the things that people are saying from the campaign stage. Because if I follow the logic of the CMS actuary, if Elizabeth Warren got her way and the federal government made insulin, and handed it out for free in every fire station in America. Because the cost of the product is less than the rebate that is given, I ask you, does that mean that premiums will go up?